In today's episode of Crypto Over Coffee, we're talking about how to navigate the crypto bull run and more specifically, how to avoid the top four mistakes that you can make in a crypto bull run that are gonna limit your ability to make and keep your profits. So I'm gonna walk you through what those major issues are, how to avoid them. And I'll be giving this to you from my perspective, having been through several crypto bull runs and making a lot of these mistakes myself. So please do hit the subscribe button, follow me on your podcast platform of your choosing, and let's go ahead and get started. So the first mistake that I see people making time and time again, and one that I myself have been guilty of many times in the past because I'm a student of technology, someone who loves to learn and experiment and find different cool things in the crypto space is over diversification. Now, this one's particularly prevalent because the common advice is to diversify. People say, well, if you're all in on one thing and that thing fails, then you're going to lose it all. And you know, that's true. You do need to diversify in many cases, but people take it to an extreme. Let me talk about what an extreme in that environment looks like. Over diversification is buying up hundreds of cryptocurrencies, potentially even double digits can be over diversification. If you're looking at 45, 50 cryptocurrencies, it's going to be almost impossible for you to actually track what's going on with those cryptocurrencies on a day-to-day -day basis, especially for those of you, and I think it's the majority of us who don't do crypto trading and degen stuff full-time, right? We have a family, we have children, we have lots of people have nine to five jobs still. Most people have nine to five jobs still. Most people are not sitting at their computer watching their cryptocurrency portfolio 24 hours a day. And those of us who are during the bull market are not particularly healthy. I've been there. Not fun. Don't recommend it. So over diversification is a product of trying to dive into all these different opportunities. And it does a couple things. One, it help, it prevents you from actually tracking what's going on in all of those potentially different niches that you're in, the different coins that you're in, the different chains you have to track across. There's so much surface for you to make mistakes or simply not react quickly enough when something's going off the rails. The second thing that it does is it dilutes your positions when we all have finite resources for the most part, it dilutes your positions in the areas where you can win. And so what you should be doing instead is considering the strategy that you want to play with high conviction. So the way that I've been structuring things the last couple bull runs is I've been finding three, maximum three big narratives that I think are gonna drive success in the market. And I'll avoid narratives that I think are gonna be successful, but that I don't understand very well. So the NFT market, I did okay in that space, you know, dabbling and learning about things, but I didn't dive into all these new collections because I didn't understand that space very well. I wasn't really, believing in my ability to pick winning NFT collections. And I did just fine not doing that, right? So picking a few different narratives, a few different niches in the space, you know, that might be for you this year, it might be uh, gaming and DPIN or de decentralized physical infrastructure, it might be AI coins or whatever it is that you choose, dive in there, learn as much as you can about it and pick a handful of coins in those narratives that you have high conviction across the board, fundamentals, the actual story behind the coin, the token economics, the community behind it, the team behind it, really understand what's gonna drive value in your particular narratives of choice and in the coins of your choice. Because when you invest in a somewhat diversified environment across a few different narratives, across a handful of coins in each of those narratives, but you don't go too far, you're not spreading yourself too thin. You're gonna be able to formulate a plan for when you wanna exit from those coins whether you're in profit or at a loss and you want to redistribute to something else, but you're also going to be able to actively monitor these things. You're going to be able to actually synthesize the data and what it's telling you in real time as you execute on your plan. When you're over diversified, when you have things spread all across creation, you have so many cryptocurrencies, you can't do that. You can't actually execute a plan. And I made this mistake in 2017 and there were far fewer cryptocurrencies then than there are now. And it's even harder now to actually implement this and actually be successful if uh, you don't really plan and focus on not over diversifying. And the last point that I'll make on this, it's sort of a follow on to the whole concept of um, minimizing the amount of return you can get from a, a win, a good pick, is when you're over diversified and you can only put a small amount in each thing, 
you are in many cases insulating yourself from some degree of downside risk if you made a bad call with your large investment, but it doesn't actually help you in the end because a lot of times when you're, especially when you're investing in lower or mid cap coins, the likelihood is the risk is the risk reward ratio is maybe not necessarily in your favor. And so you could end up losing three times as many bets that you made just each for smaller amounts, but you're still kind of losing the same amount or more than if you just really did the research and picked a handful of high conviction plays. And in that case, I think you, the odds are in your favor by picking higher conviction plays and doing them in a less crazy diversified way. So again, I'm not saying don't diversify. I'm not saying don't spread, you know, sort of your your plan out across multiple different narratives. I'm just saying don't overdo it. People do that time and time again and get burned doing it. Now, the second thing follows on from the over diversification piece and not being able to track what's going on. A lot of times people who are spread too thin in the market, they're looking at all these different uh, narratives, they're looking at all these different chains and ecosystems, and they're trying to buy the next big thing there in every single space. The problem that you get into is you get in the habit of chasing the pump. You get in a habit of chasing trends. And when you start chasing trends and chasing pumps, you are in a very dangerous place. And this happens in bull markets a lot. People see those stupid stories online, the, you know, oh, my friend, my friend made, you know, turned $50 into 500K in 24 hours on this meme coin. Or, you know, you see the Forbes article, uh, you know, local guy in Michigan turns $1,000 into a million dollars on Dogecoin. And that makes you feel this visceral fear of missing out because that's what this stuff is designed for. A lot of these people just want clicks if you're talking about Forbes. And on the more malicious end, if you're looking at certain influencers online, on X, on YouTube, etc., they're sharing these things to get you to FOMO in because there's thin liquidity and they want out. They want you to be your exit liquidity. Please don't be exit liquidity. And when you're chasing pumps, you end up becoming exit liquidity most of the time. Now, there are exceptions to this rule. Of course, there are environments where you are a little late on the trend, but you start seeing it bubbling up and you jump in and you brave through a correction and then you end up doing really well. I have examples of that happening to me. I'm sure you might have examples of that happening to you as well. But if you look on it, look at it from a sort of probabilities perspective, the odds are not in your favor on that. So how do you identify this? How do you identify whether you're chasing a pump or if there's still opportunity to be had, there's no perfect measure. There's no way to guarantee you're going to get this right. And that's why it's really, really not recommended to follow this pattern. But what can you look for? Well, if you're looking at a coin and it fits a narrative, right? Maybe it's a current narrative. So before all the situation with Ethereum has been going on with data availability and the Denkun upgrade and... Um, you know, prior to that, you saw coins like Celestia who offer data availability solutions. You saw them just going crazy every week. It seemed they're doing multiples or they were growing by double digit percentages. The issue there is that people were buying in after you had two X, three X, four X, five X. As you start to get higher up into the multiples, once you get to that 10 X mark, you start to have to be a little bit more critical about what is actually going to drive the growth that you're expecting in that risk reward versus reward picture. So say a coin's done a 10X, it fits in with the narrative, but the buying is starting to slow down a little bit. There's not any new announcement or catalyst that you can think of that's going to drive that market. You look at the market cap and you say, what would it take for this market cap to go up X percent? So let's say if the market cap needs to grow by 50%, what would that take? And if you start to think about it like that, you start to, to really think critically about what's going to drive that coin further up so that you can make a return, even though you're buying after a lot of buying has already occurred, that actually really helps you in figuring out, is this worth the risk for me? It, do I really think that there's enough here for people to sustain this buying pattern and looking at the number of holders that have this coin that are in profit. Because at a certain point, when you have a huge number of both long and short-term holders that are in a high level of profit in terms of on-chain metrics, you bet 
that there's going to be selling as you start breaking all-time high after all-time high after all-time high because even greedy people are smart enough to sell once they've made a certain amount. And people who have a plan, and you know, I harp on this on this channel all the time, people who have a plan and say, I'm gonna make this amount and I'm gonna sell. I'm gonna sell my principal, keep the rest in. Then I hit this point, I'm gonna take the rest out. Those people have a plan and they're the ones who win because they're the ones who are selling to the people who are chasing the pump. They are the ones who are coming out with profit because crypto is a zero sum game. So when you chase the pump, the likelihood is you are buying coins that someone else has already made a lot of money on and you are locking in their profits. So you need to be very sure, high conviction and have an actual thesis for how the coin that you are looking at is going to grow by the percentage you think it is when you enter that if you're going to chase it after a really large set of green candles, okay? And this third mistake, this third mistake is the one that gets me the most annoyed overall because I see it posted online a ton and it's this concept of diamond hands, okay? And people are gonna probably be on polar opposite sides of this. They're gonna say, well, no, diamond hands is a great strategy. Diamond hands where you hold on to your bags, you hold on to your crypto, even when times are tough. I get that. Great. I've held through, I've held coins that I pr probably could have sworn would be completely dead through bear markets and came out the other end and things were fine. But we're not talking about bear markets, are we? We're talking about bull markets. And in bull markets, diamond hands, that's a tough one because diamond hands implies that you are just going to hold your coins no matter what happens because you believe the market is just going to go vertical and you're going to benefit from it. The problem is, is that in practice, it doesn't actually work like that. In practice, diamond hands means you don't have a plan. Diamond hands means you're just going to hold no matter what. And in meme coin season right now, a lot of people are saying diamond hands about their meme coins. They're saying, oh, I sold too early and I capitalized a 50K profit instead of a 250K profit. Well, uh, that's actually not so bad. So I don't know why we're complaining about that. Diamond hands is not the answer because... Say you held that and you hold it into thin liquidity. Now you can't sell. So you have a lot of paper gains, but you can't sell them. Maybe you diamond hands and you ride it up to a million dollars in paper gains. You go to bed. Then the next day, the coin is tanked. You have nothing left. It happens all the time. And diamond hands is a meme. It's a cope. It's a coping strategy for people who round trip their bags. It's people who say, I held this through the bull market. I didn't sell or I couldn't sell because I didn't have liquidity to sell. And I'm going to hold it through the bear market now and I'm going to be rich. Or I bought this coin. I have high conviction. I want you to buy this coin too. Diamond hands. It's a meme, not a strategy. It's a meme, not a plan. Diamond hands is not the way that you're going to succeed in crypto, even in a bull market. You need to know when the time is to sell. And I've talked about this a lot on the channel. When the time is to sell for you is going to be different than when the time is to sell for me based on the cryptocurrency that we're talking about, based on our personal strategy, our personal goals. It's going to be, do I need to cut my losses, right? Diamond hands goes both ways. It's not just holding for more profit. It could be saying, hey, I've lost 20% on this. Do I really think that it's going to make a rebound, right? So if you're in the meme coin world, it's probably very common for you. I'm down 50% on my buy. Do I hold this or do I take my loss and move into the next thing and try and win on that one? So don't do diamond hands. Make a strategy. Make a plan. Say, if I lose 20% on this coin, I'm going to go really look, look hard at it and try and figure out, is there a catalyst? Is there social traffic out there? Is there some sort of new narrative or some sort of new feature or new community thing that's coming out that's going to drive this coin in the right direction for me. Think about it for real and actually make a plan for how you're going to execute on that particular situation. Am I going to sell this coin, take my loss, move on to the next thing? Am I going to sell for this small amount of profit knowing that even if it goes up another four or five X, I'm not worried about it because I captured profit and I live to fight another day brought those profits back in and I get to keep it. So those are the things that you need to think about. And please avoid the meme of diamond hands because it just doesn't make a lot of sense. And people are going to argue about this in the comments. I know it. They're going to say, hey, diamond hands is the way that I made X amount of dollars. 
Great. How many of those people that say diamond hands are sitting on paper gains? Gains they haven't realized, unrealized gains sitting on, you know, some DGEN wallet that they have that they can't sell. A lot of them. Most of the stories that you see online about people, you know, making all these all this money on cryptocurrencies, you know, meme coins or small caps or super low caps, etc. A lot of them are talking about unrealized gains. And that is designed explicitly to get you to FOMO in so that they can sell their coins to you for their profits. Please don't fall into that trap. And speaking of traps, the other thing that you need to avoid above all else, and this is something that happened a ton in 2021, especially because people were just trying to get the next big thing. They were trying to find the next big DeFi protocol. They were chasing yield here. They were buying NFTs here. They were approving and minting coins here. Is getting caught in hacks and exploits and scams. And I'm going to bundle all of these things into one because I think that it makes sense the way you mitigate them all fit into sort of one strategy, but they're each slightly different. So we talk about uh, hacks and exploits. I think those kind of go together, right? Hacks are encompassed by instances where a protocol that you're exposed to via smart contract risk, say you're using a DeFi protocol and you're trusting that smart contract to be implemented correctly. And then there is a hack of that smart contract or an exploit of that smart contract's logic to do something that is outside of its intent. So that may be um, a situation where you have re-entrancy re -entrancy attack uh, that's exploitable in the code, causes se severe economic damage to the protocol. Let's say it's even worse. There is an approval scam. You've approved coins in, in, in EVM chain and that's used to steal your coins. Let's say there's just a bona fide hack like you've had in, in cases of bridges where a bridge gets hacked and the funds get stolen and you, you have a loss. These are all instances where uh, you lose funds because you're trusting some code that you are not independently verifying or you can't independently verify. This happens a lot and it happens because people get FOMO, they dive in headfirst into things they don't fully understand or they don't understand the ways to mitigate the risks. So with approval-based approval, uh, approval -based tax where you're approving coins to be spent on your behalf by a smart contract for say a DEX or a decentralized exchange, uh, instead of approving all of your coins to be spent, like the default usually is, approve only the amount that you want to trade plus a certain percentage of overhead. That way, if there is an exploit, you only lose that amount. You don't lose your entire bag. So there are little things you can do to insulate yourself from those things, even if you're going to be a DGEN and dive into these protocols headfirst without verifying their authenticity or their uh, efficacy. However, there are going to be situations too where you should see the signs that you should not be diving into these projects. Few red flags to look out for. Brand new project with uh, clearly purchased X profile and uh, different social channels with a bunch of followers, but no interaction whatsoever. So very little engagement. Seemingly bought followers. Uh, very few uh, projects that are worth their scratch are going to be buying followers and buying accounts. I've seen some exceptions as crazy as that is, but by and large, if I see someone's social profile, a project social profile, that seems like it was created like a couple years ago, they've got, you know, hundred thousand followers, but no engagement on their posts. And their posts are like six weeks old to in, to in totality. And like, mm, no, not doing that. If I go and I look and their website is a carbon copy of an existing protocol like Uniswap, also a huge red flag. And then lastly, if you go to their webpage and you look how much effort has been spent on the website and are their founders, real people, doxed people, as in you know who they are. One other trick, you go on that website, you take the name and the picture of, that, of the people that are listed as founders of the project, the team, and you reverse search them. You will often find that they've taken photos from people on LinkedIn that aren't matching the names that are on the website, some random person who works in sales in Bulgaria or something. So a lot of these teams are anonymous and using fake names and they're fake people. So use that to your advantage when you're trying to figure out, should I be diving into this project? You're going to miss some early and that's okay because you're not going to lose your money to them when you do your due diligence. Now let's talk about 
uh, other forms of hacks, right? Things like giving up your seed phrase, signing malicious transactions from your hardware wallet, which will allow a hacker, if you sign the wrong thing, to steal from you even in a hardware wallet. So you have to be aware of that. Hardware wallets are not the fix here. How do you avoid these things? Number one, avoiding sense of urgency. Do not FOMO. If someone says, hey, your funds are at risk, I need you to do something now, you don't need to do anything now. Hold on a second, figure out what's going on, actually verify what that person is saying to you on Telegram or X or whatever, wherever they're contacting you and think twice. Does this make any sense? Most of the time it doesn't, but your irrational fear of losing your funds makes you do something stupid. Avoid that reaction. It's not uh, uncommon because it's a human reaction, but try and override that. The second one is only sign what you can see. Only sign transactions that you fully understand the effects of. Some hardware wallets like Keystone, for example, really are working on transaction observability, letting you see what you're signing and the effects of those things. It's not a perfect science. There are things that make it complicated, unforeseen circumstances that come from uh, side effects uh, when you're executing a smart contract. That's something that's separate. But as long as you are verifying that what you're signing is what you expect by actually verifying the details of the transaction, you are doing doing more than I would say 95 plus percent of people in crypto. And that is going to be to huge benefit because you're going to avoid getting sucked into some of the worst wallet drainers and other exploits that there are out there. So phishing, we talked about direct exploits against smart contracts or code. So the smart contract risk or bridge risk, we talked about those. The last thing that I wanna talk about is scams, scams and rug pulls. We talked a little bit about it, verifying founders, avoiding sketchy, scammy sites and avoiding uh, going to phishing sites, all those sorts of things. But avoiding scams is much harder because sometimes they're very elaborate. Sometimes a, uh, a scam is actually one that looks totally legitimate up front. It often forms forms as a, a new token that gets created. Influencers get paid to sort of pump it up and, and share it out to a bunch of people. That coin does really well. So you're establishing social proof. You're saying, wow, this, this influencer gave me a really nice pick. This project is doing great. They've got a great roadmap. Look at all these plans that they have. The founders are out there in, you know, in spaces on Twitter or on X, and this is all great. And it goes on for a while. Sometimes it even goes on for months, even more than you know, even years in some cases. And then all of a sudden, things change. There's huge market dumps. Insiders are selling their coins at massive profit and retail is wondering what the heck's going on. This stuff happens a lot in this space. And that's actually the main reason why you see a lot of people that are anti-crypto. Um, they've been forged in the fire by this exact experience or they have a family member who's gotten caught in this. And there are real victims in this case. And so you should want to avoid being a victim in these particular cases. I would say to be safe, you should never under any circumstances go and buy a coin just because an influencer says this coin is hot, especially if that influencer is saying that for somehow the, the price of that coin is gonna go five to 10 X in some ungodly short amount of time. They're likely, they likely either know something that you don't, or they're completely pumping the market full of nonsense. So never buy a coin because a YouTuber or a person on X or a person on TikTok or a person anywhere says, buy this coin, you're going to be rich because odds are you won't. It's a zero sum game. A lot of people got to lose for a few people to win. So avoiding scams is also about trusting nobody except yourself making decisions about the market based on your thesis, based on data that you can look at objectively and based off of, in general, what your risk tolerance is. Do not put more on the line than you can handle losing because in this space, losing money is actually quite easy. It's a casino after all, in a lot of ways. So last thing I wanna say on this, avoiding hacks and exploits, there are a couple of things you can do to level up your security. Uh, and I'm not gonna... Uh, make any money from mentioning these things, but there are services like uh, like Wallet Watch, for example, that help you 
cover your bases in terms of basic security best practices. Obviously having a hardware wallet is uh, table stakes. You need to be doing that. It doesn't protect you from everything, but you should absolutely be using a hardware wallet for the core things you're doing in, in this space, uh, but know how to use it. Read up online, learn how to use the thing uh, before you start using it and get good at reading transactions before you sign them. Uh, and then the last thing would be using data platforms, whether that's free stuff that's out there. There's tons of free data out there. There's certain free data on Glassnode. Uh, Dune Analytics has a lot of data that you can use. There's paid stuff like uh, Santimit. Uh, a lot of people use Arkham. I've never used it that much, but I, I've heard sort of good and bad things about it. So there's lots of places you can get data to make decisions better. Uh, include, inclusive of some of the data that I talked about throughout this video, which would be data like how many holders are in profit right now that would be sellers to your buy. So those are the things that you should be thinking about. The last thing that I want to say as a close here is in a bull market, there is lots of opportunity. It's about being focused on the opportunities that you understand and that you can make the well-reasoned decision-making around. And if you can't do that, then you need to be very, very, very cautious. And for me personally, that's the same reason why there, not every narrative that I think is going to do well is one that I'm going to be invested in because there's certain things that I understand and I've learned the lesson of not trying to address every single niche and expose myself to every single niche because I want to get the most value, the most return, I'm focusing on the things that I have high conviction in, the things that I understand and the things that I have a thesis for. So what that is for you, you can either keep that close to your, to your vest, or you can share it in the comments. You can share it with others and say, this is what I'm, how I'm approaching the bull run. So if you have other things, other mistakes that you see people making or that you've made yourself and you want to help other people learn outside of the four that I shared, leave those in the YouTube comments or publish it in the, uh, the chat box of the podcast platform. I really appreciate you stopping by and watching the video. Please do check out my newsletter as well, which is linked in the description of the video and of the podcast. I'm going to be publishing weekly crypto news updates and alpha on that newsletter. So if you are one of the special people who stick around to, sticks around to the end of my videos, you get to hear about that newsletter first. So thank you very much. Hope you and your family have a wonderful weekend ahead. And until next time, cheers.